great. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the invitation to present at this meeting. Um, as you have heard, I'm, I'm at home on my second date with SARS-CoV-2, um, but hopefully with the help of antiretroviral medication, I'll be able to have the stamina to, <laughs> to make it all the way through this presentation. Um, but at least um, the, the material that I'm presenting is, is exciting to me, so hopefully um, I'll be able to make it through. So as mentioned, I'm the director of the seed office at NIH, and our group is a team of more than 30 industry veterans and staff that help scientists and engineers and doctors and, and other healthcare professionals take their cutting edge discoveries and convert them into healthcare products. And that's the, the mandate of our office and our group. Now, the National Institutes of Health is, is a very large organization that's composed of 27 different components um, known as the institutes and centers. And those institutes and centers um, have a very uh, broad mission. And as you may have heard from uh, the discussions by our new NIH director, um, who was just recently selective, we are not only committed to funding basic science research, but we're committed to taking the information that's developed through that and converting that into healthcare solutions that actually affect people's lives. So we have a pretty um, broad mandate in the healthcare mission space. As we, as we go uh, further along through the day, you're gonna hear some more specifics from a few of my colleagues, and in particular from minority health and health disparities, from neurological disorders and stroke, um, and also from the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And you'll also be hearing from one of our newest sisters in, in this mission that we have, which is our, our colleagues at ARPA-H. So let's, let's uh, move forward. What I'm going to do is first I'm just going to talk through a little bit about the, um, the NIH Small Business Programs, which are known as America's Seed Fund. And then I'm going to talk to you about some of the additional entrepreneurial and business development uh, support and services that we provide. And, and hopefully I'm going to convince you that these services, this funding that's available through the SBR and STTR programs and our other programs are, are valuable, not just for the money that they provide, but for the additional uh, services and support that they unlock that, that can really help innovators make the right of market. <clears throat> so the NIH small business programs are actually the largest early stage source of early stage capital for life sciences in the United States. And they grow together with the R&D budget, the overall R&D budget. And they're now, it's now approached $1.3 billion a year and that is completely non-dilutive funding. So we are really sitting at this, at this privileged position between basic science discoveries, which are funded by, the, by um, much of our investments across the United States, and a handoff to our private sector partners, our investment partners, the angel investors and venture capital folks who, who are really pushing products and services through these regulatory and clinic, clinical and regulatory stages all the way to patients, and also the strategic partners and the folks who will ultimately end up creating patient access for these discoveries. So we're sitting in this early stage, and we're really the largest player in this early stage. So um, we, we hope to convince innovators to come after this funding. And, and we also hope to convince our partners in the investment world and in the business world that companies who have received this funding um, have been de-risk on a technical side, but also on a business and a commercialization side. So 
let me tell you a little bit about the NIH portfolio. What is it that we support and we fund? So every, like I said, every year we are supporting over 1,400 small businesses and they're scattered all around the country as you can see from this map. So um, one of the goals of the NIH program is really to expand the utility of this program and access to this money um, outside of the usual hotspots for um, life science product development. So you'll notice that this map with these pins looks a little bit different than if you took a look at the concentration of, let's say, venture capital investment across the United States. And that's because it's one of our stated goals to create access to this funding and enable innovators all around the country, wherever they are, when they have an innovative idea um, to solve a healthcare problem, we're there to help them gain access to this funding. It's a, it's a really important part of our mission. On the right-hand side, you can see a portfolio breakdown of the, the types of product development projects that we support. So, um, it, you know, we've, we, we did this analysis recently um, and we were maybe a little bit surprised that this breakdown across the different product types has been relatively stable over time. So um, many of the NIH funded companies, about a quarter of them are developing research tools, which are extremely important in the, in the healthcare innovation system. But the, there are also a, a large amount of support for biologic and small drugs. Um, a, large, a large component of our portfolio is in diagnostics and um, a relatively steady, but I believe it will be growing in the future component of our portfolio is in health information technology. And so we are, we're supporting innovators and we have support services for innovators and we have experts on our team who have expertise across all of these different product areas. So one of the other important aspects of our office is that we not only support the product development efforts through the SBR and STTR program across the National Institutes of Health, but we also provide that service across the other components of the Department of Health and Human Services that have um, small business programs. So that's FDA, CDC, and the Administration for Community Living. Um, so, Later on, as far as the actual um, mission space that we cover, we basically cover everything in healthcare. So that's healthcare related. So I mentioned before that, that later on in the day, you'll get some more specifics from folks at different components of the National Institutes of Health, minority health, cancer, neurological disorders and stroke, heart, lung, and blood. Um, but you're also gonna hear from our newest HHS colleague, ARPA-H. And, and although ARPA-H has a lot of flexibility, um, an enviable amount of flexibility to select and fund projects um, in very flexible ways, they also will be supporting some of their R&D efforts using small business program awards. So um, you may hear a little bit more about that later on today. So, it, you know, one of the things that, that we really like to point out to people is that these NIH portfolio companies that, that we support year after year are really many of the most innovative technology, healthcare technology companies that you'll, that you'll see in the healthcare space. So on this slide, these are NIH funded companies who are presenting at Resi this year, this week in San Francisco. And, um, and on the next slide here, you can see NIH funded companies who are support, who are presenting <clears throat> at the bio, biotech showcase this year. So it's, it's really such a diverse collection of, of companies. And, and it never ceases to surprise me um, if I hear in the news about a successful 
life science company or, or a successful life science um, acquisition or merger, um, many times I'm going back and I'm looking, did we help out that company early on? And in a shockingly large percentage of the time, the answer is yes. And that's because this funding that we provide is, is non-dilutive funding that these companies can use to really get things going before they have to go out into the big bad world and you know complicate their cap table um, by by searching for funding to keep their company going. So in the earliest stages, these companies are using NIH non-dilutive funding to really establish their proof of concept to de-risk their technologies and and to an increasing degree, they're using that money now to validate the commercial aspects of their projects too. And I'm going to talk more about that later on because that's a critical part of the of the evolution of our approach to, to supporting U.S. small businesses. I just want to kind of convince you of that point that I just made. Um, in the in the last year, we've had a number of successes, um, commercial successes, and I've just listed a few of them here on this page, but you can see here, one of the other points that I wanna make um, with this slide, and it's gonna come up in the next slide, is that the amount of dollar, the, the dollar amounts that we're talking about for NIH, from NIH are, are, it's real money. Like companies can receive as they go through different phases of this program, um, it's not uncommon to see companies that have received five to seven million dollars in non-dilutive funding over the different phases of this program. And on the next slide, I'm gonna to explain to you how that can be. So th this is just our general um, overview slide of how the small business program works. And I'm not actually gonna spend a huge amount of time talking through this, but I'm gonna make a few really important points here. So. There, there's a lot of flexibility in how this program is designed. And I just wanna point out some of these flexibilities because I think that it's important for innovators to know that there are a lot of different ways that you can use the small business program in your, in your product development journey. So it is a two-phase program with the first phase being to establish feasibility in the second phase to, to do your full R&D, but partly based on feedback from, from the users of the program, there are two increasingly popular ways to use this program. The first one is a fast track, which allows you to apply for the phase one and the phase two together so that you don't have a big break where you have to submit a second application and go through peer review again to get your phase two. And for projects that have a very clearly established product development plan with clear um, quantifiable milestones that, that can be used as a gate to phase two, the fast track is a really attractive way to go. We love the fast track. Another thing is a lot of companies, they've already established the initial feasibility. They wanna go directly into phase two. And and we have the authority to do that and companies can apply directly to phase two. Now, down in the lower right here are the, the kind of budget limits for the phase one and the phase two awards. But you know, the thing is these budget guidelines are really guidelines. They are truly guidelines, but um, NIH and CDC have waivers from the Small Business Administration to exceed those budget guidelines for selected topics. And I would encourage people to take a look at that list of topics because they're pretty broad and there's a pretty good chance that for many types of projects, especially those that require regulatory review or, or will require human testing to receive FDA approval, many of those types of topics are covered by these waivers. So, those budget guidelines, which some people erroneously think of as caps, although in some cases they are, if you took a look at the, at the average award amounts for an NIH award, 
they're roughly equivalent to those guidelines. So what that means is that just as many people are receiving awards with budgets that are above those guidelines as there are people receiving awards under those guidelines. So I really encourage people to think that through. Now, so you might be thinking, okay, well, how does that get you to five to seven million dollars? Well, these specialized programs you can see in the center of the of the slide, the commercialization readiness pilot program, the CRP program, and also the phase 2B program, those programs can provide up to an additional, say, $3 million to continue your commercialization efforts. So when you tack those dollars, if you are successful in all phases of the program, you can stack that money on top of the money for your phase one and your phase two. And that's how you can get to these larger dollar amounts. And you know, the, the program is a competitive program, but um, those companies that are successful and are making their way through this commercialization journey successfully um, can get access to that kind of money. And then the whole point of our program is really to strengthen these projects so that they can continue on and be successful in the private sector even projects that don't require regulatory approval, which there are, you know, there are projects that don't require regulatory approval to make their way into the marketplace. Um, even then, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on the commercialization and the marketing and the sales side and the payment side. So what we're doing is we're trying to position companies to be successful in the long run. And that's really what our goal is. Now, there are many details that, that people need to know to be successful. Um, there, are, there are details related to eligibility around the differences between SBIR and STTR. Um, lots, of, lots of questions about the application process and the review process, policy, um, we also support projects through SBIR contracts, which are solicitations for much more specific um, topics. Um, and all of those resources, including sample applications, are available on our website. So I encourage you to go to our website um, and take a look at those resources. And feel free to contact us through the website if you have any questions. The, the standard receipt dates for small business program funding are the same every year. They're September 5th, January 5th, and April 5th. And um, I do just want to say a word about um, the process for receiving these awards because um, the NIH peer review process um, is a great way to get feedback on your projects. And, and every time I give a, a talk, um, it seems like there's somebody who has gone through this process and they, they have uh, some <laughs> constructive feedback about the review process. But what I would say about the NIH peer review process is that um, people in the life sciences field very much value the technical validation that comes from a successful, that comes along with a successful NIH Small Business Program Award. But increasingly over the years, we've combined that kind of peer review feedback with, with feedback from reviewers who have strong commercialization and product development and entrepreneurial background. So many times these are serial entrepreneurs who um, have been successful themselves many times. They may be um, from within academic medical centers. They may be at small businesses themselves. And it, it's one of the goals of our office to continuously improve that process so that the types of feedback and validation that come from that review process are, are really providing 
value, adding value to these projects. And so that when people see an SBIR funded project coming out of NIH, they, they know that that project has been carefully reviewed, not just for its technical aspects, but for its commercialization potential. So although it's a work in progress, um, that's, that's really one of the primary objectives of, of what we're trying to achieve. So I, I do want to impart upon people two really important pieces of advice. The first piece of advice is if you are considering submitting an application, um, regardless of how you're, how you're putting together that application, it is really important for you to talk to a program officer at least a month before the application deadline. And, and I hear from people all the time that tell me about the useful guidance and support that they received from the program staff. So you can go to our website and you can see this, this little box here that's circled in red. We make it very easy for you to find the, the right person to talk to. So based on your mission or the type of technology and the domain you're working in, we'll point you directly to the staff who are the types of people that, that are handling your particular application at the Institute or Center that are relevant for you. And it's really important to talk to them because um, you will get useful guidance, you'll get useful feedback, and it's a great way to avoid surprises. And I can tell you that if you're gonna put the time and effort into completing an SBIR application or an STTR application, it is absolutely in your best interest to add the extra <laughs> proportionally small amount of time to check in with the program staff and, and talk to them about your application, let them know what you're doing, and. Give, them, give yourself the benefit of receiving feedback from them. There's also a way to use a tool online um, called NIH Report, um, which will allow you to search through funded applications. And the, the good thing there is that you can look for applications that are in your, your subject area and, um, and basically see who the program staff are, um, who you should contact. So don't hesitate to do that. The second piece of advice is please be prepared to resubmit. I've got two quotes here from people, um, which I'm sure you're reading right now, but they both basically make the same point. And um, I know that as people are, as innovators who are at JP Morgan Week and are in San Francisco, I think everybody who is there understands that it's a competitive world out there and persistence is really necessary to be successful. Um, it, is, it is not uncommon for people to have to resubmit in order to be, um, to be successful in, in getting their award. And um, although sometimes it might be frustrating, I think that many times there, there is useful feedback and guidance coming through the peer review process, which will help you strengthen your project. And, and we hope that the need to resubmit um, is really helping to improve your projects, but please don't give up. Um, we, we know that um, it can be frustrating, but hey, it's a competitive world and, and um, and it may you you may have to to stick with it in order to get this funding. But if you do, I think it's worth it. Another point that I want to make is that, which somewhat related to this, is that this has held steady over the years. About a quarter of all of our awards go to new investigators who have never had an award before. Sometimes people come to me and they say, "Hey, you know, this system is rigged. These awards go to the same people all the time." I'm like, "No, that is not true." A quarter of our awards are going every single year, every single cycle to companies who have never received a small business program award before. And, um, and I 
am, am actually committed and our group is committed to actually increasing that percentage because one of the things that we would very much like to do is, is increase access to this funding across the country to areas of the country that have not had access to this funding in the past, um, to underrepresented innovators who maybe don't live or work in, in biotechnology hotspots to really make it easy for them to easier for them to compete for this funding. So um, be persistent and keep trying. And I promise you um, that if you get this funding, it will be very useful for you. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about some of the entrepreneurial and product development support that comes along with this funding. So once you have received a small business award, um, it really unlocks your ability to access a number of programs and services that can be of great value to you and to your company and to your project. So our office is, is serving kind of as a hub for NIH entrepreneurship and product development programs and services. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about a number of the programs and services that are available um, across all innovators that are funded by NIH. But I also wanna, wanna make sure that everybody knows that within the individual institutes and centers, there is a lot of action and there is a, there's just an increasing appetite to provide more tailored and more specific entrepreneurial and product development support services. And a number of the institutes and centers are really stepping up to the plate with great programs and services. You'll probably hear about some of them later today. Um, but, you know, as, as an appreciation for um, the need for these types of entrepreneurial and product de development services increases, NIH is stepping up to the plate all across the different institutes and centers. So I just want to make sure people know that. But one of our main um, programs for SBIR and STTR funded companies is the NIH Technical and Business Assistance Program. This is commonly referred to as TABA. And we have gone to great lengths to improve our TABA programs over time. That's partly based on some changes in the legislation that gave us some gave us and companies a little more flexibility um, and also access to some more money. So I'm going to tell you how our technical and business assistance program works and and hopefully convince you that uh, that it is a great way to strengthen your project as a as an NIH funded company. So the first part for phase one companies, we have a needs assessment program. So any phase one company can request a needs assessment report. And what a needs assessment report is really a gap analysis. It's, it's a gap analysis that helps you understand um, where and strategize for your next steps in product development. So in phase one, with phase one awards, you only have access to um, TABA services or funding up to a dollar amount that's $6,500, which you know isn't really very much money. But we have created this needs assessment program so that phase one companies, rather than taking that money um, themselves, they can request this needs assessment report from us and identify the, the gaps in their commercialization strategy. I'm gonna talk more in detail about this in a second, but the whole idea for this is that that needs assessment report can act as a roadmap for you so that when you submit your phase two application, you can write into your budget up to $50,000 for vendor services to address the gaps that, you, that you've identified using the needs assessment report. So, it's a, it's a staged approach to technical and business assistance that A, helps people understand where their gaps are while they're in their phase one, and B, use that information to request funding in their phase two application to address those gaps. So that's the basis of, of how our 
um, program is set up, we've been putting about 200 companies, 200 projects through the needs assessment analysis annually. Um, that gap analysis is is led by independent by an independent third party, um, RTI, and the RTI team has collected a group of experts and a a stable of folks who can really add value to projects across the whole NIH mission space. And it's been really impressive. So they have people that work across all the different subject domains, uh, across all the different product uh, types, and they can analyze projects across these four different domains. And what they're really doing is they're taking a look at these projects and they're asking the types of questions you see on the right hand side of the slide. So do you need a market analysis? Has the value proposition been pressure tested? You know, for business model profitability, do you already have a pricing and reimbursement strategy? Do you have a roadmap to profitability? Um, from a manufacturing regulatory clinical point of view, have you thought about the manufacturing requirements? Do you have a plan for that? Um, what's your regulatory pathway? You know, have you have you identified a predicate device? Um, what clinical studies are going to be required, and how confident of you uh, of that are you? Um, you know, what's your what's your solid IP strategy? Do you have a solid IP strategy? And and have you done any freedom to operate analysis? You know, these are questions that that these analysts are taking a look at. And I can tell you that there are many, many projects, maybe most projects can be very, very strong in some of these areas. And in other areas, they, they may not have, have even the first, they might not have even thought of these, these issues. And that might be okay, depending on your plan as a small business, but it might be, um, a glaring problem that's going to prevent you from moving forward and prevent you from from being able to receive follow-on funding. And so, what the gap analysis is doing is providing you with this information um, so that you can act on it. Now, as you transition into your phase two, and and you request this fat phase two TABA in your application, we really want to help people be successful in using that TABA funding to maximum benefit. And, and, you know, what we did in the last year, and some of you, especially um, the aficionados or awardees who have been in our program for a while know that over the last year or so, we actually ran a pilot program for phase two TABA, which was called uh, TABA Consulting Services, where we actually provide, we facilitated and provided companies with consulting services that were matched to their needs. And when we did that, we learned a lot. We learned a lot from the pilot program. And one of the main things that we learned was it's very difficult to, or non-trivial, to establish a very clear statement of work to hire somebody to do $50,000 worth of work that's gonna be very valuable for you. And, and a lot of our entrepreneurs and residents and experts and our team spent a lot of time working with companies doing that. And we learned a lot about that. We also learned a lot about how to help companies find the right vendors to provide those services. So what we're doing now and the evolution of, of our phase two TABA is a way to scale the approach and help all companies be able to find the right people and hire the right people to provide these TABA services. So in order to do that, instead of providing those services ourselves, we're encouraging people to write this TABA funding into their phase two application, talk to us and our team and have a consultation with us to help understand how you can write a scope of work to maximally leverage that $50,000. So you can have a consultation with our, with our team 
We'll talk it over with you. We'll talk to you about your needs assessment report if you've got one, hopefully you do. We also have sample statements of work that cover many of the most popular areas of fate of, of TABA support. And, and that way we're enabling companies to get what they need. And it allows us to um, really reach many more of the companies in our portfolio and help them get what they need to be successful. What can you get for 50K? I mean, uh, this is another thing that, that was really a, a learning experience for us. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to think about what you want and write a statement of work. And then when you, when you go out to vendors and ask them what they can provide, um, I, I can probably count on one hand the number of times when, when people came back with quotes that were 50K or less. So I think it's worth kind of pointing out um, a few of the things. Th these are real examples of things that, that people received through the TABA consulting services, but which I think are viable um, for people to hope to receive with that $50,000 that they can request in phase two TABA. Um, many of these, these types of things um, can be very valuable to companies. You know, market entry and launch strategy report. Um, a lot of times the innovators in our portfolio are, are scientists who, who don't have experience bringing a product to market. Issues like pricing model and reimbursement strategy or um, or a regulatory strategy or roadmap or preparing for a pre-IND meeting. These are things that you can't pay for with R&D money from your award. These are all things that you, know, you, you, you may need to do to be successful, but you would have to pay for them yourself. You can get access to this $50,000 in addition to your R&D funding to um, achieve these goals, and, and we can help you be successful in doing that. Everybody has, their, uh, has plenty of work to do, um, and it takes time and effort to, to plan for what you need and write an SOW and find a vendor, and you can contact us and get our assistance in in doing that. And I think you'll to, to great benefit. So that's our, that's the TABA program that we have and the vision for how that TABA program works and how we can help you use that program to be successful. Who are some of the people who are helping out with that? Well, we have a seed innovator support team and that team is composed of two general groups of people, entrepreneurs and residents and subject matter experts. The EIRs are people who um, have, you know, lived, lived in, the, in the life science world. Many of them have been successful uh, founders or have worked at successful companies. They've been through this, you know, this rodeo a number of times. A lot of them are, you know, later in their career, um, and this is a, a way for them to kind of give back and 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 work with people who are who are early on in this process. The EIRs um, they provide uh, consultations for business development, for regulatory, for reimbursement. Um, we also have a team of targeted subject matter experts. And we call on them for consultations that are more focused with, around specific regulatory and reimbursement topics. And many of those folks are people who are former FDA. Um, maybe they have experience working at CMS. They worked in the healthcare settings, or they were, or they have been in the consulting world themselves. And these are the people who are part of our team. You know, we have like a in-house consulting team, and basically that group, um, these are the people that are assisting us not only with our programs, but in our consultations with with our funded companies. 
So one of the other um, great programs that we have for companies in our portfolio is, as I mentioned before, we try very hard to facilitate partnering and investment opportunities for the companies that we fund. So we don't want to just fund companies and then throw that money into a black hole and hope for the best. We know that the money that we're contributing, even if it's five to seven million dollars, is really a drop in the bucket compared to what it's going to take most of these companies and most of these products to make it successfully into the healthcare ecosystem, to, to be accessible to patients. And in recognition of that, we, we want to work hard to help our companies achieve the follow-on funding and the next steps that they need to be successful. So one of the things we do is we support our companies to go off and pitch at many of the meetings that you see on this slide, including Biotech Showcase and, and Resi. And what we do is we, we plan pre-event webinars, we have presentation templates, our entrepreneurs and residents are, are pitch coaching these companies. At most of these meetings where we send a lot of companies, we actually have one of our entrepreneurs and residents on site who can help these companies out, who can help the founder or the presenter, help them make connections, answer questions for them. It's a really great way for um, companies to take advantage of our network and our connections. And, and also, um, you know, it takes a lot of practice to, to get good at, at the pitch. And our, our team is just a crack team of experts at helping people whip those pitches into shape. And, and I can tell if you, if you watch these companies that we send in the meetings, I guarantee you that the quality of the pitches um, it is really good. And it's partly because of all the work we put into helping companies prepare. We send about a hundred companies each year to events. Um, we are matching companies up with events twice a year in January and in June. Um, a lot of times uh, we're, we're, we're looking at companies, we're deciding how far along are they, what, what meeting is a good match for them, um, and we're trying to make that work. But when we pick a company, um, we, we support their registration to the meeting and we provide them with all these services. So it's a great way to really take advantage of our of our network. In the in the last years, few years, we've also noticed that many of the investors that we talk to and the strategic partners, they they like these NIH companies that we're sending to meetings. And so what we've done is we've created a a, a website of all the companies that we've prepared and sent out to meetings. And it's a searchable website. You can find it from, from the SEED website. It allows you to search by the different event or by technology type or by state. And you can find details and contact information for all these companies um, that, that we've prepared and sent out onto the road. And now this database has probably around 400 companies in it and growing every single year. Um, but it's a great way for investors to find some of our most exciting and investment ready companies to take a look at. Um, and you can you can find contact information, details about their award um, and about their projects. And it's just a, a great resource. It's also um, a, a great way for a, a feather in the cap for companies who have gone through the program and a way for investors to find them. So we have a number of other entrepreneurial support programs, and I'm just going to mention three. Um, the first one is our newest program. It's our bioentrepreneurship capstone program. So this is a program that is really designed to kind of um, 
increase the pipeline, we realize that we have to start a little bit early if we want to get people interested in entrepreneurship and product development, that in the earlier stages of their training as students or postdocs or early career faculty, we, we want to get them interested in things like lean startup fundamentals, customer discovery, product development training. So what this program does is it has some online content and an and a online um, portal for people, for, for these cohorts to kind of learn about things. And then if they have a project that, um, that they want to move forward, there, there's a selection process by which they can be matched up with mentors and they can be mentored to develop that into a project and potentially develop that and spin that into a company. And even to go and present at the bio meeting at the end of this um, cohort training. So this is called the Bio Entrepreneurship Capstone Program. If you're a student or a postdoc or an early career faculty member, I encourage you to go to this website and check it out. Two of the other programs that have been around for a while are the C3I program. This is Concept to Clinic. This is mainly for medical device innovators, but it supports small businesses and also um, academic innovators. And then our i at NIH program. i at NIH, this is for phase one teams, phase one SBRS TTR teams. Um, and many of you are familiar with i but i is really a customer discovery program where uh, customer discovery, um, yeah, customer discovery program where basically you learn how to go out and just like, just like as a scientist, you're validating the technical aspects of your project with all of the experiments you're doing. I think of i as bringing that same rigorous validation mind step to all of the um, business development and entrepreneurial aspects of your project by getting out and talking to people about it. So you conduct interviews over eight weeks, develop a business model canvas. It's a great program. And you can find information about all of these programs at the website listed on the bottom of this page. Um, one of the things I mentioned about the Bio Entrepreneurship Capstone Program is that we we are really trying to expand access to our programs. And getting back to this kind of um, pipeline issue, um, we, we have decided that one of the ways to um, increase the diversity of the people that have access to our money is to, is to bring different types of people into our ecosystem. And one of the ways that we do that we're doing that is by providing supplements to existing companies who are funded to basically hire a candidate from a diverse background. So this is this is supplemental funding. This is additional free funding that you can request on top of your R and D award to bring in a candidate um, from a diverse background. And it's a great, it, it's, this is a win-win situation for everybody because for small businesses who are strapped for personnel and strapped for um, resources, it's a great way to get some extra help. Um, for, for young people and people who are um, maybe interested in product development, but they don't really have any access to that within their institution, it's a great way to kind of get together with a small business and get some experience, um, all funded potentially by, by money from NIH. So this is a great program. Um, it, it's, it's relatively new. We've had some success with it, um, but we also like to use the program as a way to help um, match people up, right? It's a, it's, it's a way to match up uh, young investigators who are interested in product development with small businesses who could who could use the support. So this is a great new program, and it fits in very well with with many of our our most important goals for the program. Now I want to just kind of wrap things up by by bringing it back to you know why 
why we actually do all this. So um, in that slide at the beginning, I talked about um, some of the kind of investment successes that we've seen over the last year or so in our portfolio. And, um, and that's great. And, and a lot of the discussion and the, you know, the news coverage around JP Morgan week is around big financial deals and, and, and everybody's excited about those. And I'm excited about them too. But for me, those are a means to an end. They're not the end. For me, the end is really patient access to innovative new treatments and therapies that solve healthcare problems for people. And on this page, um, I've listed some of our more recent ones. So now three of these, the, the, the Duchesne's uh, approval it is really huge. I mean, this FDA approval from Agamory is for Catalyst Pharmaceuticals is is really groundbreaking. This is a new approval for um, for a disease that's just a devastating disease. One of our great successes. We're very proud of that. Now, Pain Care Labs is a cool one. This is a project that you know has been in the works for a while, um, but. I can tell you, you, you see this picture of this little girl getting a shot. I have two little girls and I can tell you, I've never seen my kids look like that um, when they received a vaccination. And basically this is a little vibrating tool that sits on the arm. It can be used for, for, um, for children or for adults. And basically it like masks the pain of a, of a shot. And you know, you might think, oh yeah, what's the big deal? But actually, that kind of um, fear of, of injections and pain from injections is a major barrier to um, vaccination. So this is a great product. They also have another product, which is a pain relief product, both on the market. Um, Sanguina's world's first non-invasive home anemia test. This is another great product, NIH supported. Um, there are two other ones listed here that are not actually on the on the market, but they're making their way there. Um, that's a, a non-invasive portable respiratory monitor and a vibration belt that's received breakthrough device designation, which, which um, is for osteoarthritis and preventing uh, bone breaks from osteoarthritis. So these are just some examples of the innovative types of products and services that that are coming out of NIH support. And it's really, you know, products like these, and these are the stories that, you know, keep us all um, getting up in the morning and going into work happily every single day. We love these stories. And in fact, we have a website um, where we have a ever-growing list of nearly 100 success stories. And these, and my definition of success is a product or service that's available and helping people out in the wild. And you can see those stories. You can search for them all across different product types, across different parts of the country. And we're really proud of that website because not only does that help people understand the types of projects that we support, but it helps our legislators and our representatives understand why funding for NIH is so important. And, and lest they forget that that funding that they're providing will be paying dividends down the road um, for them and their loved ones and their healthcare providers. So I would encourage you to take a look at that website um, for more information and more stories like these. So um, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I, I just want to have this slide here to show you all the different ways that you can contact us. I also want to thank the, the members of my team who are so important in all these aspects of what we do. Stephanie Fertig is the director of the NIH Small Business Programs in our office. Um, Chris Sassiella is the director of our Innovator Support Team. Eric Padmore is our senior advisor for entrepreneurial support. He's our he he's um, working on the bio 
BioE Capstone and our other entrepreneurial programs. And Kate Fritz is our operations manager. So that's kind of the core team that that are really responsible for many of the many of the programs and services that you see, along with all the other members of our team that provide guidance and support across all these programs. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, and I'm I'm glad that I that I made it all the way through. Thank you very much. Hi there. My name is uh, Ken Kirshner. We've just finished a resubmission on a um, an application, and our program officer for CDC was not able to tell us um, what our impact score was relative to the pay line. And that put us in a dilemma. We didn't know whether we had a good shot just standing on our original application or whether it was urgent to resubmit. I'm wondering if you can shed any light on that. Yeah, this this gets to um, one of the one of the kind of issues with how the small business program is set up across NIH or HHS, and that's that each one of the individual institutes and centers, and indeed the the operational divisions like CDC, they all have their own internal process for how they make funding decisions. So. Some of the institutes or centers have pay lines that are just straight pay lines that are, are based on the score. Others have what they call zone of consideration where there's a range of scores where they consider applications and others have neither. They just, you know, they use the score together with program priorities to make decisions. So unfortunately, the best source of information is really the person who is closest to your award who in your case is the CDC program officer. So, you know, it, it's unfortunate that they can't provide you with more guidance. I would encourage you to, you know, pester them some more, but because of the way the, the funding decisions are made, that aspect of the program is really decentralized to the individual institutes and centers. So the best advice that we can give people, and I'm sorry that it's not helpful for you in this situation, is you're, you are going to the best source of information you can find. Thank you, Matt. I think we can wrap up. Great, thanks. Thank